All right, so this week we are going to cover bioterrorism and mycoplasma and urea plasma, so two separate PowerPoints. We are going to first start with the bioterrorism PowerPoint here. All right, so we'll just skip through these objectives. But the definition of bioterrorism is the intentional use of any microbes, so it could be bacteria, viruses, fungi, parasites, or even the toxins they produce to purposefully injure people, animals, or crops. Biological warfare then, of course, is using that to gain an advantage over another country or another part of a country, whatever it might be. So there is some history of criminal use, um, salmonella, First case of salmonella bioterrorism was it was purposely sprayed onto salad bars in restaurants, causing salmonella food poisoning. Of course, we all know anthrax is a big bioterrorism agent because it is bacillus and thresis produces spores. And they can put those spores in, say, contaminated letters in one incident where you open a letter and breathe in the spores. Ricin toxin is, ricin is a toxin made from castor beans. This has also been sent through the mail in history. Um, as a result of all this, there kind of was this Bioterrorism Preparedness and Response Act of 2002 put together. It just provides guidelines on possession, use, and transfer of agents that they have selected that they know are known bioterrorism agents. So they made a list of these ones that are typically used or potentially could be used, and those are the ones that we control kind of who has them, how we're doing, you know, using them, possessing them, that kind of thing. All right. So with that being said, there, of course, going back to the very beginning of micro, we know there's biosafety levels. And there's four biosafety levels. Most of these bioterrorism organisms are going to need to be at a level of three or higher. Um, but there are some that are biosafety level two, so let's just review these. Biosafety level one is basically anything that doesn't really cause much harm, doesn't do much for disease. A great example there would be Bacillus subtilis. That's a common normal flora of the skin. Otherwise, it doesn't do a lot. Biosafety level two is the one that you find in most hospitals, um, in the majority of our hospitals around. These are ones that are definitely known to cause human disease, but they're not as transmissible as some of the others that we'll talk about. So hepatitis, um, salmonella, E. coli, staph aureus, all of those fit into biosafety level two. Anything that we have played with in the lab is a biosafety level two. Biosafety level three is more of a serious condition, plus can be transmitted like a respiratory route. So this is where tuberculosis comes in. Because that can remain suspended in the air for so long, we need to be really careful about which biosafety level we're using to potentially work up a case of tuberculosis. Same as bacillus and thrasis, that would have to be level three since it produces spores that can be respiratory. So anything like that would be a level three. Level three, again, is the one where it's an enclosed hood where you're putting the hands into like these attached gloves and you, everything is enclosed though. You can't be open to anything. And then finally, biosafety level four, is a high risk of serious disease. This is where Ebola comes in, smallpox, those big bad boys, um, and only very select few sites have this. All right, now there are three categories of public health preparedness with bioterrorism that are separate from the biosafety levels of our hoods and equipment. So anything that we put into category A for bioterrorism agents means they are very impactful. They're very big, serious, contenders. So category A is kind of like our worst of worst bioterrorism agents. They are known to do the most harm, the most mortality. Then category B is kind of medium risk and category C is less impact. So here's kind of an example of where things fit. So category A you see is anthrax, francisella, yersinia, botulism, um, your smallpox, your hemorrhagic fever viruses like Ebola, Marburg, all are category A. And then category B is your brucella, salmonella, E. coli 0157, ricin toxin. And then category C is tuberculosis and some other viruses again. So just know that category A is like the most impactful, down to C is the least impactful out of the bio threats. All right, so what makes a good characteristic of a bioterrorism agent? It's that it's easily made. You don't need a lot of skill to put together whatever you're going to launch or do. It's mobile, you can transport it easily, and it causes 
huge impact to your population in that it's a good fatality rate. It's easily transmissible between person to person. Um, it causes a lot of panic. I mean, those are all ideal settings for a good bioterrorism agent. So different transmission modes, there's aerosolized, so up, you know, breathing in through the air, contaminating food and water, or directly applied to the person. Um, anytime that spores, endospores are involved, that's especially ideal because they can be aerosolized, so it's easier to pass them to people. Um, they're pretty stable, so they are definitely going to usually work and easily breathe in. So in response to everything with bioterrorism capabilities, um, things growing in increasing nature, there was a laboratory response network, LRN, set up between all the hospitals, and I'm sure you guys have heard of this. Basically, it communicates between the hospital labs, which are known as our Sentinel labs. So Sentinel labs would be the normal hospital labs to the regional reference labs. Maybe that's LabCorp, maybe that's your State Department of Health and then up to the CDC. That way, any time that we have something that is a positive that's on a list, we have to report that we have that. And it's things like bioterrorism, but it's also STD testing, it's influenza, anything known to cause an outbreak is reported. We have to track and know if outbreaks are becoming a potential, if there's an area that's really swelling up with outbreaks, that kind of thing. So in this case, we use that whole communication network to especially report on for bioterrorism. We have to reference from the hospital lab the organism or the culture to the regional reference lab for confirmation, for stereotyping, to get more details on the organism. So reference labs, again, can be your public health labs, your state department. It could be just a larger reference lab and then they are going to report to the CDC. There's also a couple others here mentioned as well as really in-depth laboratories for micro. So the national labs would be that CDC, the um, Army Medical Research and Navy Medical Research as well. So again, as it says, they can perform complex studies. So they have a lot more resources at hand. There are a lot more specialty training. So they can get it down to the exact serotype and everything of what's going on. They'll also do interviews with people. Where did you get this? You know, what food did you eat? That kind of thing. So they can really narrow down what's happening. All right. This is just a chart of key indicators of a potential event. So when to know there might be a bioterrorism event happening. So there is going to be a disease that you pick up that's not a normal route of entry. Um, multiple patients are going to have the exact same infection in the same area, above normal rates of morbidity, mortality, um, things like that are all going to give a clue that maybe it's a bioterrorism event happening. All right, so let's get into each of our organisms that we link with this that I want to make sure you know. So let's review again, Bacillus anthracis. This is, of course, a gram-positive rod. It can cause three different forms of anthrax, the cutaneous, the GI, or the respiratory. Cutaneous is going to produce these like black skin ulcers, which I show in the picture there on the skin. GI is ingesting the spores. And then inhalation is typically always due to a bioterrorism event or maybe it's just a bad lab accident. Exposure, generally occupational, unless, of course, it is used as a bioterrorism agent. So again, anthrax is the one that you can also nickname wool sorters, um, coming from the shearing of sheep with spores embedded in their wool um, because it can be found in the soil. So that was a nickname for anthrax. So that would be kind of the occupational hazard with the shearing of sheep and picking it up that way. All right, as far as specimen collection goes, you're going to collect whatever's wrong with them. If they have a black skin ulcer, you're going to collect a skin swab from that black skin ulcer. If they potentially have it in the respiratory a sputum sample or blood samples to see if it hit the bloodstream, whatever the complaint or seemingly symptoms are. Again, when you grow up bacillus anthracis, it's going to have that Medusa head morphology, or you can call, call it comma projections meaning it's not perfectly circular. It has these projections coming out. It is non-hemolytic, and it has what we call an egg white consistency, meaning when you beat eggs, like when people make meringue and beat eggs, they get stiff and form peaks. That's kind of what this does. When you go to take your loop and pick it up, 
it kind of lifts off the auger and it's kind of stickier. So it's showing that in the picture here where it lifts up like that egg white consistency. In the bottom picture showing the gram stain, bacillus gram stain are very large. They're large gram pause rods. They're very, what we call box cars. They're very in your face gram pause rods. And sometimes in the gram stain, you can see that they did have spores because where the spores are at, they won't pick up the stain. So that's not always true. You might not always see that picture perfect, but just to note that sometimes you might see the area where the spore is at. As far as presumptive identification of anthrax, you will know you potentially have anthrax when you see these non-hemolytic colonies that maybe have these projections out from it. When you gram stain it, it's a large gram pause broad. It's catalase positive, non-modal. All of that leads to the potential bacillus enteresis. <laughs> All right, sorry, I had to get a drink of water. My throat is killing me. All right, Yersinia pestis is our next one. This is known as causing the black death or bubonic plague. Um, it's passed by a flea, so the flea is the vector. So they used to use this in a way of they would take contaminated bodies and throw them over into the enemy's line so that they would contaminate and get the plague over there and kill their own army. So we still see Yersinia pestis to this day as a infection with prairie dogs. So if you ever encounter like a rodent and a prairie dog that has this or get a flea from them onto you, you could still get Yersinia pestis via a zoonotic infection. But it is well known to be used as a bioterrorism infection. So here's kind of the life cycle of Yersinia pestis with the rodents and vectors involved. There's two types of plague this causes. It can cause the bubonic plague or the pneumonic plague, which is involving the lungs. It just depends on the route of entry into the body. All right, so the other plague that wasn't mentioned there, yeah, I don't think I had it on here, was, of course, it can become septicemic. So it can become a whole blood, all over blood infection. So again, transmission is from those infected fleas, handling anything, like if you're handling a contaminated rodent or dead body of one, or in the case of bioterrorism, an aerosolized bacteria. Symptoms, a lot of the same symptoms as any infection, fever, chills, headache, but with the bubonic plague, it also causes what we call buboes, which are very inflamed lymph nodes that are very swollen. And again, you have lymph nodes all over your body. So these all can become very inflamed, um, swollen, painful. So buboes really links to bubonic plague. Um, can also cause gangrene in fingers and nose. So weaponized Yersinia pestis for bioterrorism purposes, mostly we're gonna see this occur as a pneumonic plague, a respiratory, because you're breathing it in. So again, you're gonna get a respiratory sample if you suspect this, or if it's become septicemic, then you'll get a blood culture sample. As far as what we see, when we gram stain it, it's gram neg rods. They are said to have a bipolar staining where they kind of look like a safety pin appearance. Non-hemolytic on the auger, kind of a fried egg appearance. Otherwise, it's a non-lactose fermenter, catalase pause, oxidase negative, urease negative, are some info details on this. There's the fried egg appearance kind of on the auger. And then again, this is supposed to be gram neg rod. I don't think that's the best picture if I should find a one that's a little better picture, but it's trying to show you the safety pin look. So you can kind of see how the staining is uneven there and it gets that safety pin look. All right, on to Francisella tularensis, another zoonotic disease, um, but again, it can become bioterrorism. So it causes tularemia, again, carried by rodents, rabbits, beavers, muskrats. So a lot of times we do see tularemia whenever we handle those infected animals or if there's a vector on them that bites you or you're bitten by the animal, whatever it might be. For bioterrorism, it's going to be when you inhale it. It's been aerosolized. The big thing with tularemia, or not tularemia, Francisella tularensis, the reason they love that this one is a bioterrorism is it doesn't take a lot for it to become infectious. Little as 10 organisms, and that will cause you a great infection. So that's why it's a super good one. It's a very little amount to cause you the disease. 
So there is a skin form to this known as ulceral glandular. You can see the skin ulcer there in the picture. But what it does here to the skin, it can also do to the organs, through lesions on your organs, very damaging to your organs. And that's where the harmful infection comes. It's not something that you can easily fight off when it's getting on those organs. So as far as symptoms go, same kind of symptoms. Um, you'll see lesions at the site of wherever it entered, unless it's respiratory. Again, respiratory is linked with the bioterrorism. For what we detected, um, we can look for blood cultures if we think it's septicemic, or you can get a biopsy from the lesions. It is, again, a biosafety level three, which all these kind of have been. As far as identification, we can see this one growing on BCYE auger. I know BCYE auger, we've linked that with Legionella, but Francisola does like to grow on it as well because it is a fastidious organism. So this is not going to just grow on McConkie auger. Yes, it's a gram neg rod, but it will not grow on McConkie auger. It is oxidase negative, catalase pause, urease negative, or just some info on it. So there's the, it's actually a graminate cockabacilli, which you could really see in this picture. It's not a big rod shape, it's very small. And then again, when it does grow on chocolate auger, it's just, it's small, medium, um, grayish. It's nothing exciting on the auger look. Brucella, another zoonotic one, also causing bioterrorism, comes from an animal host. There's four different ones, each one linked with a different animal. All are gram negative cockabacilli, so abortus is cattle. Melatensis is sheep or goats, we is swine, pigs, and canis is dogs. Again, biosafety level three. So you can get this from breaks in your skin if you're handling like contaminated animals or if you ingest food products or in the case of bioterrorism, again, it's aerosolized. So it quickly disseminates through the body. It hits multiple organs and causes inflammation and damage to each of those organ systems. And that's why it's such a big infection. All right, again, similar symptoms and known use as a biologic weapon. So loves to grow in CO2 conditions. It is non-hemolytic, catalase and oxidase positive, urease positive, non-modal are some details there. So there you can see the gram-negative cacobacilli. Again, non-hemolytic little gray colonies, nothing exciting on the auger. It is a fastidious organism, so it's not going to really grow on McConkie auger either on this one. Burkholderia, um, we haven't talked a lot about Burkholderia. That was probably at the end of micro one. Um, it is a non-fermenter gramnig rod. There are two types here, Burkholderia mallei, which is known to cause glanders disease. Glanders is a disease within like donkeys, mules, and horses. And then Burkholderi pseudomalii, which causes meliodosis. That is an infection in humans. So again, it's kind of a zoonotic disease for Burkholderi malii. In that you can get it if you do have contact with those infected animals. It doesn't take much, again, to cause an infection. It's a low infectious dose. So... It was used as bioterrorism in World War I to purposely infect like the horses um, that were used for transportation. Pseudomalii causes melidosis. This one's more involved with humans, not as much with animals, but again, contaminated food, water. If the animals are infected, you come into contact with them. So again, gramnig rod, non-pigmented, non-fermenter, also non-modal, catalase pause, Indole negative are some ideas here. Likes to grow an extra CO2. There's what it looks like. Nothing exciting on the auger plates. Again, it looks white, gray, medium. Coxilia burnettii causes Q fever. This is found in different animals, but also can be reservoir in humans. So a lot of vet or animal handlers are more exposed to this. Can transmit it through urine, milk, feces, tissues, fluids, Anything coming from those contaminated sources. All right, so Q fever is dangerous because only half of it can be symptomatic. So if you could have it, not know it. But what it does cause in symptoms, it causes kind of like a fever, headaches, something that looks similar to influenza. It is an intracellular parasitic organism. So this is not something 
that we are going to grow out on an auger plate. It would be more processed like a viral culture where you have to grow the cells and look for it inside the cells since it's an obligate intracellular organism. There is blood tests that you can do where you look for antibodies, serology, or there's fluorescent antibody testing as well. Nowadays, I would assume that most places probably do a PCR technique. Variola virus is, of course, smallpox. Um, variola major is the bigger one, the one that um, is the most risk, 30% mortality and unvaccinated. Again, we don't have the vaccine for this anymore because it was eradicated. So the only time that smallpox will show up is with bioterrorism. There is not really a reason for you to get it otherwise. So transmission, if somebody does get it from bioterrorism, it's easily transmittable to others through respiratory droplets or direct contact with those lesions that are pussing. So that the vesicular rash, it, that um, fluid coming out of there is a very infectious. Here's kind of what it looks like. It does come all over your body. Again, there is a vaccination, but again, it was eradicated in 1980, so they stopped giving it. People that did get it, they have a scar on their upper arm. Um, right now, the only two documented smallpox stocks are CDC and the Russian one. I mentioned this back in the virology chapter. There might be more, but those are the documented stocks. And then, of course, our hemorrhagic fevers, Ebola, we've all just recently seen that outbreak and terror with it. Marburg, Lhasa, Hanta, Dengue, Deng, Dengue, I never say that right. Yellow fever, all are really good bioterrorism viruses because there's really no known cure. Um, you just treat the patient and hope for the best. Ebola alone has a 70 to 90% fatality rate, which is why it makes it so scary for people. Marburg has about 25%, which is still a big fatality rate. Don't let that fool you, that's still a big one. And again, only supported treatment, that's what makes all of these very risky. So the for the virus is two, three weeks. And the reason they're called hemorrhagic is you get hemorrhaging through the mucous membrane. So hemorrhaging out the opening can cause a disseminated intravascular coag, DIC condition, which you know is always an emergency situation with where you all of a sudden break out in one big hemorrhage. So that is the crux of the whole thing with these viral fevers. And then toxins. You don't necessarily need the organism to be present to cause the disease. They can use just the toxin to do the effect that they want. Clostridium botulinum, botulism if you will, toxin is a good one that they use because it's a well-known cause of paralysis. We all use it as Botox. But if you use it in the right dosage amount and not in a controlled ability, it can cause paralysis throughout the body. There is ricin, which we talked about briefly in the beginning, made from castor beans. So that is kind of it on bioterrorism. Know each of those organisms. Again, we've learned them all at some point, but refresh yourself with them. Know the basic test results that go with each one, how they're passed, that kind of thing. All right, so let's move to our other PowerPoint, which is mycoplasma and urea plasma. This is a much briefer PowerPoint, thankfully. All right, so mycoplasma, there's only really two species that we know as human pathogens, which is mycoplasma pneumoniae, which of course causes pneumonia. It's what we call walking pneumonia. And then there's mycoplasma hominis, which is a urogenital tract disease. Mycoplasmas are very, very small, very small. They're very difficult to detect. We would do, um, we're not going to grow these on agar as a normal, typical bacterial workup. We might kind of see them in cell culture contaminants. Um, overall, they're just difficult to detect because they don't possess cell walls. So mycoplasma and urea plasma both are cell wall deficient bacteria. As a result of that, there's definitely antibiotics that don't work on them. Any antibiotic that targets the walls would be useless to use on mycoplasma and urea plasma. So when we do grow these out, they're going to need an auger that has cholesterol and fatty acids in it to help them grow. And when they do grow, they are going to be considered fried egg appearance. So there you kind of see it off an auger plate. 
Um, as far as transmission goes, it's sexual contact, especially for that mycoplasma hominis, which is found in the urogenital tract. Otherwise, respiratory secretions for mycoplasma pneumoniae causing that walking pneumonia. So there's the diseases linked with it, um, especially for mycoplasma pneumoniae, all lung kind of respiratory based. And then mycoplasma hominis, again, your genital tract, so it can be seen with a lot of different STD situation with the pelvic inflammatory disease, otherwise some UTI stuff. Urea plasma urea lyticum is also found in the urogenital tract, so very similar to mycoplasma hominis here as far as what it causes. I'm not going to go in depth on the diseases here. Just keep in mind where it's found, you should be able to link it to a disease bed. Specimen collection, um, because they don't have a cell wall, they're extremely sensitive to drying out, so you have to use very specific transport media if you do suspect this. And then here's more details on each one. Typically for mycoplasma pneumonia, we're just looking for the antibodies to the walking pneumonia. If we suspect somebody has it, we will do um, serology testing. So we would just draw blood. As far as hominis and urea lyticum, the ones that are found urogenital, there is some culture augers, broths that we can use there if we suspect. So that's just a specific stain that is used when they do think they have it. It's detailed here at the bottom. I am not going to test you on that stain, so you do not need to worry about that. And so this was just taken out of your textbook, just kind of showing you the differences here. Again, because they're cell wall deficient, you'll notice I never gave you a gram stain result. And that's because you can't gram stain them. There's no cell wall to gram stain. Again, they're not able to use any of the beta-lactams anything like penicillin because they're missing that gram wall, Gra that gram wall, that cell wall. Um, the idea to use here, if you do suspect it, like in, I know one of my students who is just recently at um, her micro rotation said that they did use acridine orange. Again, acridine orange is that fluorescent stain that targets nucleic acid. Well, mycoplasma urea do, of course, have nucleic acids in them. So she said that they did use that on like blood cultures in case there was like a mycoplasma urea plasma um, suspected there. They, you can use acridine orange because that will go and bind the nucleic acid and find it that way and fluoresce if it is there. But again, gram stain is worthless. All right, so that is it for this week. Um, if you guys do have any questions, please be free. Please be sure to holler. Otherwise, I will see all of you in class. Thanks.